Would you like to know more about how pharma manufacturing works? Every month, we bring you an insider conversation with our experts here at Lonza, with our partners and leaders in the industry. Hi, my name is Martina Hestericová, and this is A View On, a podcast brought to you by Lonza. It takes about 10 to 15 years, a tremendous effort combined with top expertise and more than 2 billion Swiss francs to develop a single successful drug. And yet, nine out of every 10 drug candidates fail in clinical trials. With the pipeline of biologic drugs, so those based on proteins, antibodies, and cell therapies, targeting more and more complex and poorly understood conditions, the drug development process may become even more challenging. So how can drug developers decrease the risk of their candidates failing in clinical trials? One way is to identify all potential risks with regard to safety, efficacy, and manufacturing in the early stages of discovery. But what is the best way to achieve this? I asked Raymond Doninger, the senior director of commercial development for Lonza's early development services to give an answer to this question. So hi, Raymond. Thanks so much for joining us today. How are you? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. So Raymond, you've got over 25 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry. And I mean, it ranges from R&D to prescribing use of pharmaceuticals, and even you hold a medical degree. I'm really excited to hear your take on de-risking but before we dive deeper into the topic, would you mind defining the terms for our listeners? Why is it important? So I guess um, if I think about de-risking, I, I think about identifying where there are potentials for uh, my development journey to derail and um, addressing those risks, addressing those potential areas for this derailment, if you like, as early as possible. And, and it, it is very much around identification. There are some occasions where you can actually make changes and so you can mitigate or remove the risk or the potential risk. But sometimes it really is just having the, the awareness that there could be a potential issue, um, which you know then may require just a little bit more investigation, et cetera. So it really is at an early stage and, and at every step really in the journey, um, being aware of of where there are potential areas that um, could cause problems in in the development journey. Is this applicable to all types of drugs in development, ranging from small molecules even to cell and gene therapies, or are we strictly talking about biologics at the moment? Yeah, no, Martina, I think um, that's a great question, but obviously it, it absolutely is all types of, of drugs. And in fact, you know, not just uh, not just drugs, uh, you know, if one's building a house, uh, there's, there's, it's a good idea to, to look at how you're going to go through that process, how you're going to, you know, do the design, set the foundations, build the walls, the roof, etc. And, and where there are potential risks that may occur to that project as well. So yeah, absolutely across all different types of modalities in, in the pharma industry. I love the parallel to building a house now when I'm at home cooking, I'll be thinking about de-risking the process early on. Very nice. But going back to drug development and manufacturing, the attrition rates of drug candidates are quite high. And the next generation modalities are targeting indications that may bring the statistics even higher. A good example for this is developing therapies targeting Alzheimer's, I guess. Could de-risking the development process of these therapies improve their chances? I think, Martini, you're absolutely correct. There is, as you mentioned, high attrition rates in, in the pharma industry. And actually, the attrition rates have been relatively stubborn. And what I mean by that is that if you look at um, attrition rates in pharma development in general, they, they've stayed relatively high over a very, very long period of time. And there are a number of reasons for that, not the least of which is that it's a hugely complicated process. And the tools that we currently have are not necessarily very predictive. 
um, if you look at a, a percentage of, of molecules in development. Um, the most of that attrition happens early. And I think if we look at it, there's two ways to look at it. The one is we want potential drugs that are not going to be safe or effective to fail at that stage, right? We, we want it so that it would be wanted attrition because something may make a lot of scientific sense, but it may not be um, something that, that should be or could be taken into humans. Um, and then obviously there's, there's also something which I guess you could call unwanted attrition in some ways. And this is where you do have drugs that actually do have potential. And this is where to some degree that de-risking element really does come to the fore. We can then design uh, earlier development projects uh, in, in a way that allows us to or gives us the greatest chance of being able to identify whether this is something that we, you know, should fail or whether this is something that should proceed uh, under the, uh, the knowledge of uh, where potential risks may lie or having had some of those risks identified and mitigated. I'm curious, does it happen often that drugs fail in the later stages, so say already during clinical trials? The attrition, as you would imagine, is, is a lot higher in the early development space than when you get further down the development line. Drugs, uh, they still do fail in phase three clinical trials, but ideally you obviously don't want to have that happen. That, that is hugely costly and very, very disappointing for patients, very disappointing for pharma companies, very disappointing for investors. Um, so that, that is something that one absolutely wants to avoid, but it does still happen. But the attrition rates obviously are lower. But what are the reasons a drug can actually fail? So I think if we look at attrition, um, there are a number of different reasons why drugs fail. And you can broadly categorize them. Many drugs in, in the early development space fail because of safety issues. It turns out that they are going to have an effect on the patient that is unwanted. And that within the context of the risk benefit um, equation that, that physicians, clinicians, and patients always have to consider no, no treatment or none that I'm aware of, at least, um, is absolutely safe. Most treatments have some form of side effects um, at a particular dose. And so there's always this risk-benefit relationship that one has to consider. But it may be that the safety uh, profile of the, of the particular uh, drug candidate is just such that risk outweighs the benefit. So that's the safety side. There's also obviously the efficacy side. It may be that a drug could have fantastic promise in a laboratory, but it needs to be used to treat people, not, not laboratory tests, not in vitro assays or, or in vivo assays. And so whilst it may show a lot of promise there, it either cannot get to the target in human, uh, in the patient, or it can't do it at the right levels to be safe, to have that risk uh, benefit uh, effect, or the body clears it too quickly, et cetera. Or maybe there's a, a third one even where you might have a commercial reason. So it's just too expensive to get a drug that would be safe and at effective dose to the market. It is too, too expensive and nobody would be able to afford it, or uh, it wouldn't be competitive in the market. There are other drugs that could do uh, similar to what the drug in development could do, but at a much lower cost. Interesting. And uh, how can we approach this from a de-risking perspective to help drug candidates succeed? So one can um, do de-risking very, very early on. And even you know, in the very early discovery phases, one can look at uh, the particular disease target and say, well, if I impact this target, what is the theoretical impact likely to be on a patient? So there are certain things that we can do on a sort of almost theoretical scientific basis, and that's the start, right? That's where one has to, to look. Now, it could be that if I modulate the dose, then I could have an effect, but it wouldn't activate you know, the immune system such that it becomes a safety concern and it, it can be used very locally and it can and do what, what I'd like it to do. You know, in, in small molecules, there are ways of looking at this in silico, but there are also ways of doing that uh, with biologics. And by in silico, I mean using computational assessment to look at the, the, the drug sequence or, or the drug design to, uh, to, to affect the design of the molecule to, to give you a, a potentially a theoretical outcome. 
how precise is this though? So when we talk about the theoretical in silico predictions, mm-hmm. if I look at it from my perspective as uh, someone with experience in enzymology and protein design, we know that the 3D structures we get from a protein crystal does not necessarily correspond to the functionality of the protein because it will behave differently when it's in solution. Correct. So I wonder to what extent are these in silico predictions really true? And that's a fantastic question, Martina, really. And I think this is, um, you know, a question that comes up a lot. I hear that a lot in uh, in discussions with drug developers. The tools are not infallible, right? And, and they tend to be over-predictive. They tend to predict risk more than there is potential risk in general. It's better to be safe than sorry, I guess. Huh? <laughs> exactly. But I mean, I would love to stand here and say that, that, that there are uh, current models um, that are absolutely predictive, but that's just not the case uh, for a number of reasons. One is, you know, the, uh, the algorithms are, are, are not perfect. Understanding crystal structure, as you've mentioned, based on sequences is not necessarily perfect. Um, and then the drug has to interact with very, very complex systems once it gets into a human. And our ability to model that is not perfect. Um, I'm sure technology will advance in this area over the course of time. Uh, but at this point in time, it's fair to say that they are a tool, but they are not the end. They're one step in this de-risking. But in, in the in silico space, Typically, you know, one would y- not use these assays or this assessment as a go, no go decision. And very often it would be used to rank. So you may have three, four, five, 10, 100 potential candidates with slight sequence variations. And you want to decide which are the top three, top five, top 10, or maybe the top one that you would like to take forward. And you decide to prioritize moving those forward into further development than you would the others that you would have, rather than saying, I'm not going to progress with the sequence because it's going to be highly immunogenic in humans. So we've been talking about in silico tools a lot. What tools are available when you want to take this to the wet lab? Um A number of different things that uh, that drug developers will look at. You know, once one has a, an assessment from the in silico perspective and there are a number of different candidates, then the next step in, in the de-risking process would be to see whether any of those potential risks that have been identified uh, may in fact be relevant risks. One of the steps in, in, in looking at that is to, um, to do in vitro assays. It's a very exciting area at the moment. The advantage of cell-based assays is that you can use human-derived cells. So whilst it's not looking at it at an organism perspective, the whole patient perspective, you are able to look at what the impact of human cells is when they're exposed to the drug. And in fact, you can mimic to some degree the immune response. So you can almost do some element of toxicity testing in these in vitro assays. And this is quite an exciting new space. The other exciting area is things like, uh, um, you know, in vitro tissue models, uh, organ on a chip uh, models um, to, to assess toxicity. Our very first episode in the first season was about organoids. And I wonder, can we go this complex With the risking, could we in the future, hopefully in the near future, start testing therapies on organoids grown from samples from a particular patient? So could we make it more personalized? I'm not suggesting necessarily that organoids are the answer, but these sorts of models, these more complex three-dimensional uh, in vitro models, in my personal opinion, are going to be a, a cornerstone, if you like, uh, certainly of, of safety testing. I think the promise there is probably more in the cell therapy, um, perhaps even gene therapy and biologic space, maybe more so than small molecules. It's probably easier to do them with small molecules. With that, that's, the, that's the odd bit. But I think that the applicability is greater with large molecules and cell therapies. It is very difficult to mimic what's going to happen at an organism level with the current technologies that we have. Now, we've been talking about de-risking the development of drug candidates. I wonder 
what can be done to de-risk the manufacturing of these products? The earliest way to start that is, you know, right in the discovery phase. Um, I think, you know, if you're a, a drug developer and you're developing a small molecule that is very similar to small molecules that are already marketed, um, you obviously have less risk because you have an understanding of the structure. And there are all sorts of tools that we can use to look at to understand that and to look at the manufacturing steps and how many steps are likely to be required in the manufacture. The same is true of large molecules. Um, so if you're developing a standard IgG molecule, there's so much known about that, that you know, you, you're pretty certain that uh, you shouldn't run into significant manufacturing challenges. I think what we're seeing, and you mentioned this right at the start in the introduction, is um, uh, you know, the things are becoming more complicated. The, the days of standard mono monoclonal antibodies in development in, in large molecules is, uh, is reducing. A lot of the molecules are a lot more complicated, new generation types of molecules where maybe that background knowledge is, is not necessarily there. And then we can start by looking at using in silico tools here as well. So we can start by doing some predictive analysis based on what we know, which, you know, a lot of that information is generated on monoclonal antibodies, but it relies on protein, uh, the, the understanding of protein structure, uh, protein engineering, et cetera. And you can apply that information across different types of biological proteins, right? And, and so that's, again, where you would start. You'd take your amino acid sequence, you'd run it through in silico tools and, and assess whether or not you're likely to see challenges from a manufacturing perspective. Are you likely to have areas that are, are likely to undergo post-translational modification or which may lead to aggregation challenges that you may face? Again, being in silico tools, the same issues may occur as we spoke about previously with... Um, with understanding whether those uh, areas of potential post-translational modification, potential for aggregation, et cetera, are, are actually going to translate into real issues. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will. It means that we need to look at that and that there needs to be further testing done, or it means that maybe a candidate shows a higher level of potential for complication in the manufacturing or formulation which if you then had a choice between candidates, you may choose to go ahead and, and use one of the others, or you may decide you'd like to do some re-engineering at a sequence stage, which obviously is a lot cheaper than trying to figure out or, or create some sort of weird and wonderful formulation to, to overcome one of these challenges that you may have, let's say, for example, aggregation or absorption or, or something like that. Are there any other challenges one needs to keep in mind when de-risking a drug candidate? We can certainly talk about de-risking the molecule, but we have to understand that a lot of the risk is actually associated with how the drug is given, how often it's going to be given, and also the patient population. We have to realize that the patients that we're going to be treating very often have dysfunctional immune responses. So the immune response may not react in the way a normal healthy human's immune response would react. So they're patient factors that could impact the safety, tolerability, efficacy of the drug as well. And those really have to be thought about critically in, in, in the risk assessment that one's going to do. From your perspective, and as a person that works at Lonza's early development services, do your customers find the process for de-risking the development and manufacturing challenging? Do they see great advantages of being able to outsource these services to us? If we look at um, the sort of typical clients that are doing this sort of service, um, most of the companies that we work with are small biotechs. Um, many of them are actually virtual biotechs. They, they only have, you know, less than five, less than 10 people in the, in the entire company. And so very often, many of our clients don't have the internal capabilities to do these sorts of um, uh, de-risking programs, if you like. Um, so they will need to find partners to work with them. What we certainly try and do is um, we try very much to do exactly that, to work with our clients, to provide a service, but also to provide context, to provide an understanding based on our experience, what 
those data that the service are generating mean in the context of the de-risking element, right? So we provide, let's say, for example, we're talking about the very earliest entry point, which as we've mentioned is the in silico. So you really just need the sequence and we can have a look at the sequence. We can do an assessment and say, we can predict there are some risks from a safety perspective or that there are some risks from a manufacturability perspective with that amino acid sequence. And we don't just leave it there. We can compare that risk to what's known in terms of the risk of molecules that are on the market. And what happens if a pharma company has more than just one drug candidate in their early development? If the client has more than one candidate, we can rank those candidates for them and show the, the, the client where those candidates sit. And therefore, we can also say, based on our experience, we would suggest you might want to consider changing this area of the sequence, et cetera, to, to reduce this risk. So it's, it's very much a case of, you know, providing the service, but also providing the context and our experience and our thoughts on what that may mean. There are lots of tools to do this sort of thing, but not everybody has the, the, the background and experience to be able to help with that interpretation. And, and so our clients do, do find that very, very helpful. Really interesting. And I was about to ask if you can also suggest changes in the sequence. What do you base these suggestions on? Just on comparisons with existing therapies or is this sourced from the known information about monoclonal antibodies, even if you're working with, say, a bi or multi-specific antibody? We can look at this from an immunogenicity perspective, but we can also look at it from a manufacturability perspective. But if we look at it from an immunogenicity perspective, as an example, we're really looking at the presence of T-cell epitopes. And it doesn't matter whether it's a monoclonal antibody or um, a, you know, a, a small um, protein. As long as there are enough amino acids, um, so you know, maybe 10 amino acids in the, in the molecule, there's the potential for uh, there to be a T-cell epitope. We then combine that with looking, as you've already mentioned, at, uh, at predicting, at, at, at 3D modeling, at predicting what the actual 3D structure of the molecule is, is likely to be, and then whether or not those T-cell epitopes that have been identified are likely to be visible to the immune system within the 3D structure. We would then really focus in on those T-cell epitopes that we consider to be high risk because they're likely to be visible. Would you mind also explaining what is the T-cell epitope for our listeners? Effectively, the T-cell epitope is a sequence within the protein which if it is exposed uh, to the immune system, it has the potential to allow the immune system to recognize it as being foreign and then to mount an immune response against that. That may not be a bad thing, right? So if you are developing a vaccine, in some instances there, we may recommend areas to add more of these T-cell epitopes because you want an immune system to react or respond to the, the, the protein that you're injecting if it's a vaccine that you're trying to develop. Um, but for the most part, for therapeutics, obviously, you don't want the immune system necessarily to view the therapeutic as being foreign and mount an immune response against it because it can have a number of uh, effects that would be um, undesirable. The simplest being it could reduce the efficacy of the therapeutic over time. Uh, the worst of it being, of course, it could cause um, things like a cytokine storm, which have uh, very severe side effects for the patient. And even worse, it could ultimately lead to death. So, you know, obviously that's not the sort of scenario one wants to get into. So that that's really what a T-cell epitope is. And, and that's why we look for them, because the, um, as I say, we, we could either be looking at them to try and enhance the efficacy of the drug, but most of the time we're looking at them to try and ensure that uh, we, we, we give the therapeutic the best chance of, of being successful, both from an efficacy and safety perspective. I'd say that's a fantastic message to end with. De-risking the development and manufacturing pathway as a tool to give the therapeutic the best chance for success. Fantastic, really. Thank you so, so much for sharing your insights with us. Thanks very much, Martina. I appreciate it. And that's all for today from A View On. We will be back next month with more exciting science and technology stories. Make sure to follow us and bye for now. 